So right now in Washington, D.C., there's this thing going on called the Planetary Defense Conference. That is actually what it's called. At the beginning of the conference, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine said this. This is not about Hollywood. It's not about movies. This is about ultimately protecting the only planet we know right now to host life. And scientists there are laser focused on figuring out one thing, how to dodge an asteroid that is currently hurtling directly at Earth. Here's the thing, that asteroid, it's not real. So why are these scientists pretending that it is? To find out, we talked to one of them. I'm Kathy Flesco. I'm a planetary scientist at Los Alamos, and I use supercomputers to model um, what happens when an asteroid or a comet hits the Earth and how to stop one from hitting the Earth. And so just like you have a fire drill, just like when you sit down on a plane, they tell you about the oxygen masks and all of that. We practice this every two years because we learn from practicing. We learn from our mistakes. Why is this coming up now, right? It's like, as you said, these events in and of themselves are, we expect to be pretty rare. So, so why now? We're doing this now because this is the first time we've really been capable of doing this. And we've been buzzed a few times. So, you know, you can't deflect a tornado or a hurricane right now. You can't glue a fault shut so the San Andreas doesn't have earthquakes anymore. We can't do that yet. But with an asteroid or a comet, it looks like we're pretty much there. There's some technology that needs to be developed yet. And there's a few things we still need to learn about how these objects are composed and how they respond to being hit by a kinetic impactor or um, being ablated by potentially a standoff nuclear device or shot with a laser, th the things that we're looking at as mitigation techniques. We still need to study that very carefully. And that's why we're doing a lot of this on computer because if it goes sideways, I can push delete and go home for dinner. So <laughs> it's a much better thing to, to do a lot of this homework before it's an issue. What are the actual chances of a near-Earth object breaking through the atmosphere and actually making impact here on the ground? We actually get hit every night. If you go and, and go to a place where the sky is dark and look up, you're going to see meteors, even on a night when it's not a meteor shower. Um, and so we get this constant rain of space dust coming at us all the time. So you have something like the airburst uh, that happened in Russia a few years back. Those happen maybe once every 70 to 100 years, we think. Maybe medium-sized like Meteor Crater happen maybe every like 50, 100,000 years. Um, really big things like the one that killed the dinosaurs every 100 million years. Bigger than that, maybe only a couple of times in the history of the planet. Can you explain what happened in Russia in Chelyabinsk and why that was unique? They were actually very lucky. Uh, the Chelyabinsk object, the, the meteoroid that came in, was um, about 70 meters across at the top of the atmosphere. It was very fragile, so it broke apart and it actually exploded three times on the way down. And part of the reason it did that was that it came in at a very shallow angle. And so it had a longer path through the atmosphere to deposit its energy and sort of air break. Um, that could have been much, much worse for the people living in Chelyabinsk if it had come in at a steeper angle and had more of its energy focused on the city. They don't hit that often, but we live in a shooting gallery. These things are whizzing past us all the time. So back in the 90s, there was the shoemaker Levy 9 comet. It went so close to Jupiter, it got torn apart into a bunch of different pieces that then came back and hit Jupiter. And we watched that very carefully. And people modeled that at the time. People are still studying that event. There was asteroid Apophis that made a close approach while I was in grad school. And I will never forget that day my whole life because Apophis is a big object. It's hundreds of meters across. It's a rubble pile. So it's, it's a challenging one to deflect. In 2004, when it came by us, it was a very close approach to the Earth. And its orbit was not very certain at the time. And there was a particular point in space that if the center of mass went through this little one meter keyhole, the, the Earth's gravity would have torqued on it enough that it would bring it back around to strike us in 2029. So we were sitting in lab that day, we all skipped class and sat there frantically reloading the NASA website, waiting to see what that trajectory was. Fortunately for all of us, it did not go through the keyhole. It is not going to hit the Earth in 2029, but it is coming back. That was also a wake-up call in 2004, and that's when a lot of these meetings kicked off, 
and they've been building steam ever since. Let's say this okay. was not a drill, and okay. you know, we do detect a near-Earth object, and it is months away from wiping out a U.S. state. What, okay. what, what are some of our options? What could we do to deflect it? Months away is a really bad day. And so if you've got something with only a few months warning, that's a tough one to, to deal with. Uh, at that point, you're looking at a lot of evacuation. With maybe six months warning, you, if you're real lucky and there's some science mission or other spacecraft that's getting racked and stacked and ready to go out, you might be able to send some sort of nuclear device with it, but that's, that's a big reach because you have to prepare that sort of mission extremely carefully. And so six months might not be enough time to turn that around even. Uh, when we talk about short warning times, we're talking about a decade. It takes years to prepare a spacecraft, to design it, to get it ready, to build it, to field it, to launch it. And then it takes years to get it out into deep space to where it needs to be to do the deflection. You're talking about something that's loading out in space that's the size of the Empire State Building potentially. And you've got to push that thing around to get it off of Earth's orbit. And so let's say we do have a longer runway. You mentioned using a nuclear device, for example, to, to divert its course. We have a bunch of options that we're considering and it's very dependent on what the context is. What kind of object is it? How big is it? How soon is it coming? And these are all, of course, hypotheticals. For a nuclear device, you have uh, two options, like roasting a marshmallow. You can either stick it in the fire or you can hold back and, and get the, the lighter brown color on the marshmallow, depending on whether you like it crispy or not, right? With the nuclear standoff burst, you, how close you are to the object determines how much energy you're gonna source into it and you vaporize a thin layer off the surface and then that comes off and pushes it the other direction. Um, if you need to destroy the object and disperse the fragments, then uh, for example, if it's something really, really big, like if it were a, a kilometer across, then you might need to do this. Then you can actually um, detonate the nuclear device much closer in and potentially destroy and disperse it. Now, other options, um, people are looking at lasers as another option. The challenge with that one, as they've reported so far, and I'm not working on this project, is keeping the optics clean. So you're, you're flying through this cloud of vapor that you're roasting off the surface, and it keeps up just plating onto the surface of your lens, and it gunks up your laser. So you have to have this very creative windshield wiper to keep that clean. Um, other options, um, there's a group in Europe that's looking at using ion engines, where you have a spacecraft that then has a double-ended ion engine. And so you fly in and you park it next to your asteroid and you have one ion engine that's pushing you toward the asteroid and then you fire another one at the asteroid and you embed the exhaust from your ion engine into the surface and do a very gentle push that way. But of course that takes a very long time. Another thing that's coming up is the DART mission, uh, which is a technology demonstration mission that NASA is going to do in a couple of years where they're going to send a small spacecraft out to a binary asteroid system. And so you've got the, the big asteroid and then you've got a little moonlet going around it. And they're going to change the orbit of the little moonlet around the big asteroid. So we're getting to the point where we're doing these baby steps, engineering and tech demos that are convincing us that, yeah, maybe we can get there. And so those are sort of the prime candidates right now. Got it. Let's say all of these diversion tactics fail. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between an impact that takes place on land versus an impact that takes place in the water? Earth is a water world, so a lot of these things will just hit the ocean. At that point, you're concerned about potential atmospheric effects, but we can model that. You just need to get people out of the vicinity and let it fall, potentially, if it's small enough. And it turns out, based on research done by some colleagues of mine about tsunamis, it actually takes a pretty hard punch to make a tsunami. If something hits on land, then it takes a much smaller object to make a problem. When I say big, um, I'm saying a city killer is going to be like football field size, so 100 meters, 150 meters by 250 meters. If it's 100 meters and it's made of metal, you're going to make meteor crater. Um, and if meteor crater were made today, Flagstaff ain't coming out alive. 
Um, so that's, that's a city killer. If it's something that's um, more fluffy, more, more fragile, then um, that's going to be an airburst. So if that hit over a populated area, yeah, that's going to burn some houses down pretty badly. Um, that's going to look like a multi-megaton nuclear attack on that city, um, just without the radiation. Once you're up to a kilometer, that's going to be a global disaster because that's going to kick up a lot of gunk into the atmosphere here, and it's going to change the climate in pretty bad ways at that point. If you look back into the early 1800s, um, I believe it was the 1820s, there was a super volcanic eruption that put a bunch of ash up into the upper atmosphere and blocked out enough sun that they didn't have summer in the northern hemisphere that year. Uh, crops in the U.S. failed. There was a famine. Um, it snowed in New England that summer in July. And that's the sort of things we would see. So there's big incentives to avoid that kind of impact. Yes, there is. And fortunately, they don't happen very often. So <laughs> that's why we're planning now is because we, we want to have some thoughts on this. and We want to have a plan before anything were to happen. And we're finally, as a species, at the point where we're technically capable of thinking about this. And so it's time to start doing our homework because we don't want to be writing this final paper during finals week. You know, we, we want to have this solved before we've got something coming at us. This has been incredibly informative and a little scary, but that's okay. Thank you very much.